customer experience, but then that can be broken into things like brand experience or user experience, et cetera. And the, the reality is it's all of those experience that make up the journey that the customers take. The customer is already in the mindset of their journey and their experience. They honestly don't really care about the person they talk to. They care about the experience they had. Did they make it easy? Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My name is Nick Blimsdahl. My guest this week is Sean Albertson. Sean has more than two decades of experience in customer experience leadership. Sean's expertise includes professional speaking, workshop facilitation, coaching, and consultancy, all with a singular focus on elevating customer loyalty by reducing effort. At the core of Sean's approach lies, rocks, lies his rock strategy designed to harness the power of customer insights. This strategy integrates survey data, data, operation metrics, journey analytics, and text analytics, all synergistically enhanced with the cutting edge artificial intelligence. And I'm super excited. I think there is a lot of other things that I can talk about with this guy. He's got over 20 years experience. And, you know, what I would like to do is kind of just start off by you know, con- congratulating him, uh, Sean. Uh, so welcome and, and congratulations to taking that big leap and and releasing that first book. Absolutely. You know, it's it's been a long time coming. If anybody's ever tried to write a book, uh, you know, you it's hard to get there. Uh, can take a lot of time. So long time coming, but you know, happy to be able to join you, Nick. This is a great podcast. I've been listening to it for a while. So really glad to to be here with you today. And so for the listeners who don't know. Um, Explain maybe a little bit about or just the 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 book and what makes you what made you start the book or what made you create absolutely it. yeah absolutely so I I've been doing CX as a, you know as you mentioned two decades uh, way yeah. too long seems like um, and my the camp I'm in you know because it seems like in CX you got to find a camp am I an M- NPS camp am I a yeah. customer effort am I a CSAT camp well I guess technically I don't belong to any one camp but. The one that really impacted my career was the Effortless Experience, the book that came out back in 2013. Yeah. Um, and so customer effort has been something I've been really focused on my entire career, because again, you can do all you want to try to delight customers, but if something's hard to do, you know, you're know, you not going to make any headway. And so a lot of focus there. And so uh, the my book specifically takes kind of the ideas and the concepts of effortless or frictionless and uh, really helps a company understand how to go out and find the most important challenges. And that's why I would call it rocks because uh, I like to consider that these are rocks that get in the way of the customer journey. And so we need to remove those and their journey will be easier. And so a lot of focus there on understanding the experience and using data to determine how do we find those most important? Because they, they may not be always the highest volume challenges, but what's most important may actually be ones that are more painful, but less frequent. So there's a lot of opportunity to use data now and AI and everything else that's coming around to really understand that and, and dig in and figure out where they are and how to how to take care of them. Well, I definitely want to dig into that. So there's guys and gals in, in leadership who who talk the talk. There's people who walk the walk and then there's people who drive the drive. And this fella has a a a, a, a Jeep that drives over rocks. He doesn't just go around him he goes right over through him and he has rocks right on the side of his his jeep so um well played on that and highly recommend anybody before we even kick this thing off and start taking down and and talking about rocks that you go and start following this guy because he has plenty to talk about so with that you know what I where I want to start is that there's so many things around customer experience there's these big buzzwords about customer experience there's the expectation of customer experience. And like you even said, the the effort of customer experience, which I think is a great metric to follow. And I think it was a great uh, camp to fall into. Um, how have you seen that customer expectation change throughout the years that you've been in, in focusing on this space? Well, uh, you know, I started on customer service back before it was customer experience. And all I can say is the experience now and the journey much more complex. In the old days, mailroom, 
maybe at a local office and a, and a call center now with, with chat bots and social media and any number of proprietary solutions a company has to communicate, you know, like say through their website or in other means that it's really gotten so much more complex. Um, and that creates what, what we hope we're doing is we're creating all these new options for our customers to make it easier. Most of us are trying to do that, but what we're actually finding is it's actually making it harder. I mean, right now, you know, this little thing, it's all its fault, right? You know, if it's not easy, if I can't, you know, if I can't do something really easy, let's say on my mobile device or on the app, et cetera, you know, I'm already, you know, behind the eight ball as a customer thinking, well, that customer, that company's not really all that great yet. So it's gotten so much more complex and um, it's about to, you know, exponentially get more complex with all, you know, Gen AI and everything else that's coming and the, even the new technology that's going to be building on top of it. Um, I can only imagine, you know, what the experience is going to be like in the near future, but now's the time, which is so important for this kind of message. Now's the time for companies and, and really people in business to think about and say, well, we've got to get our people aligned first. Then we got to get our processes refined, for instance, to measure effectively before we go chasing the design of that new platform. Because too often companies, they run after the shiny new technology and they implement it just to realize that, they implemented one more silo within their business that creates a, a disjointed uh, a, you know, kind of experience for the customer. So the complexities are so much more difficult because everyone in the company is, is hitting it at different levels. And so trying to get that you know, to work right and people process then platform is what I really like to talk about. And you're preaching to the choir. And I think we just have a conversation, just sit on that for the next three days, uh, kind of a fast 72 hours, but on, on exactly what you just said. It's not just about the technology. Matter of fact, it should be focused on, on the outcome or the, the business objectives, the customer expectations, the, the metrics that you're trying to achieve, and then reverse engineer that back to the technology. The, the system is broken. Uh, and, yeah. and maybe that's the technology and, and the sales reps and, and the, the process itself. It says, hey, look at the technology and look how awesome we are. We should, you should do business with us. Hey, look, we're in the top magic quadrant. You should do business with us. Hey, look at this new whiz bang generation, generative AI. You should do business with us instead of just saying, what are your needs? Where are the rocks that you guys have? Where are the biggest pain points that you guys are trying to, uh, you're dealing with? And let's start asking better questions to getting better answers and then focusing on the technology if the technology is the right solution. Because there's, you know, more more often than not, maybe it's just the process or the people that that need to be adjusted or trained or, you know, uh, a fix or tweak or create a, a better workflow to create a better experience to reduce that effort. So, um, you know, tell me more about that from from your perspective as somebody who's been in the business, not on the sales side, on the technology side, but on somebody who who have actually lived that for 20 plus years. Yeah, absolutely. And and you really hit it on the head about measurement. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But you know, so I've done CX. I, I started in customer service. I basically had every leadership role you can have across customer service or the content center from operations, training, quality, you know, across the board. But then I ran CX programs for marketing. I actually ran them from product and pricing. And then, yeah, I spent some time in IT and even in digital teams, again, running the experience. Because again, we think customer experience, but then that can be broken into things like brand experience or user experience, et cetera. And the, the reality is, it's all of those experiences that make up the journey that the customers take. The key here is, and, and I kind of mentioned earlier, I'm not, you know, I am in a camp, but I'm not in a camp. But the reality is, I don't care what camp you're in. And you, you hit on it measurement. But the key question I always want to ask is, can you predict anything with what you're measuring? Too often we go and we implement our measurements, whether it's net promoter score or OSAT or CSAT or customer satisfaction index. We do all of the stuff around to measure. Oh, we're measuring the experience. And, and the reality is if you don't actually test those measures against actual results, you may just be measuring for measurement's sake. And that's where for me, you know, measuring for purpose, that purpose being experience or effort, et cetera. So for instance, I've seen in companies I've worked for and with that net promoter works. There's a lot of articles or blogs and, you know, things that come out about every six months. Oh, it's dead. It's, you know, it's not around, going to be around anymore. Well, when it predicts disloyal, like if, if I can look at which I have and see that a detractor is going to be four times more likely to attrit or have negative revenue, I, I know it predicts. 
But the challenge with NPS, like many people say, as a, as a standalone is why. That's where I look at customer effort score, because by measuring that and looking at the individual experience, the action and activity that I'm doing and understanding if it's hard or not, that actually lets me predict that downstream behavior. So in fact, what I've seen is when, you know, and even in the book, the effortless experience they talked about, you know, if it's hard, customers can be four times more likely, you know, to show disloyal behavior. I'm seeing it now, it's now five times more likely. It's growing because we're all looking at, you know, the last best experience is now our minimum expectation for the next one. And so it's, our expectations are getting higher. So again, being able to look at it and seeing that if something's hard, then I'm five times more likely to show disloyal behavior, including being a detractor and they're five, five times, four or five times more likely to actually leave. But not only that, guess what? I know what they were doing. I know what they were doing that was so hard. So there's nothing more actionable than going, fix that, <laughs> go fix that. Um, and if like, if your use of satisfaction or your use of a metric can't help you tell that story and truly predict behavior, I'd go back and try a few other things because it's about measuring for that purpose. And the, the key opportunity is using that data to understand it. And again, that's a big part of where I go when I say, if you want to find rocks, start with customer effort score, because that will really pinpoint where those rocks are in your experiences or in your journeys. That's so spot on. You, 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 you attacked both sides, which I appreciate. You attack the, the technology side, and then you also attack the, the, the people that are actually doing the metrics themselves uh, in, in the most loving way possible. But at the same time, the, you can't just measure for measurement's sake. You can't just say, well, the last person who got fired uh, was measuring NPS score. And look, we, we bumped up by 0.23% in the last three months. Like, yay. And you're like, okay, well, what are you going to do about that? What makes you measure the NPS score? And what else are you measuring it? And where's the correlation? If you can't draw these correlations, you can't align these to business objectives and you can't act upon it, or what makes you give us a, a one out of five, or how easy was it to do business with us? And you're not asking that additional clarifying question, then, you, then it's not actionable. Then you're just receiving information for information's sake. And when leadership comes to you and says, what's the benefit of customer experience or, or employee experience on, on that side? And why should we invest more money into you? And they don't have the actual data. Then then they're kind of sitting on the silo, looking around saying, hey, marketing, hey, sales, hey, operations, hey, HR, can you please help me out? Remember, we're buddies. And they're like, hey, I'm just trying to save my job. I'm just trying to trying to keep afloat on my side too. But as somebody who has been in the business, going back to you one more time here, where where is that disconnect of, of just the customer service or customer experience people on aligning those metrics and measuring what's always been measured or actually stepping out and measuring what's actually purposeful? Well, primarily, and, and at least in most of the you know, human-driven channels like chat or, or phone, it's, the, it's, it's a break in purpose. And, and I get it. And, I, and I've always had, I mean, I've worked obviously on both sides and I've always had this debate with you know, executives and leaders and even at the C-level about what to measure and how to measure it. The reality is you can measure multiple purpose, you know, in the same intent gets a little tricky because it's always a little bit squishy. Um, but for instance, let's use an example, a company I was working with, you know, they were very in the camp of overall satisfaction after a phone call because they used it for uh, stuff to, to either promote or, or bonuses for the employees. And, and they, at an employee level, how satisfied were you working with this, this agent? And I get it. And it makes a ton of sense on paper until you really dig into it. So how many times, if you run that as a program listener, you know, how many times do you end up with a, an agent who comes to you and says, well, the customer was complaining about the overall experience and I got a bad score, but I did okay. You know, or, or vice versa, you know, where the, the customer enters in the comments. Well, you know, Sean was all right. You know, there's nothing wrong with Sean, but the fact I had to talk to you 12 times to get this resolved, that was the problem. So the customer is already in the mindset of their journey and their experience. They honestly don't really care about the person they talk to. They care about the experience they had. So what we've done in the past, and, and I've done this at different companies, you, you measure both. Maybe you measure effort and you measure overall satisfaction. Now they get muddy 
because someone who says it was high effort, you can almost count that their OSAT's going to impact as well. But you can kind of do that for that kind of purpose. But truly transformational organizations change. And they change by focusing, you know what, even at the agent level, I want to focus on effort. Did they make it easy by explaining how the website works, by helping understand, you know, the journey and, and looking, you know, both up and downstream back to say, well, what happened that I can help you overcome and forward to say what might happen? So really, you know, taking that opportunity that the agent is a catalyst for ease, if you will, and effort, knowing by having to call, the customer's effort is probably already up. They couldn't self-serve it. They couldn't do it on the app or on the website in many cases. So really embracing that opportunity and then not measuring in the way to say, you know, how do I measure this agent for the performance that they did as much as you're focusing on overall? How did they help the customer journey and that customer experience? And you could focus more on things like resolution and, and you know, first contact resolution or rates like that, that are, that are more of those blended metrics. But the key here is really taking that opportunity to really think about what's most important to you. Is it more important to have one agent uh, understand if, if a customer was happier with them than another? Or is it really more important to understand the customer's journey and that you're, you're improving it and making it easier for them? I think if you really take that step back and ask that question, the answer will be pretty clear. For all the listeners, I would recommend you just take that last three or four minutes that Sean was talking about and what he broke down and listen to it three or more times, take notes, and then bring that to leadership and say, let's start implementing what Sean is saying. And if I have any questions, you can always come back to myself and you can always go back to Sean and say, clarify what you actually mean here or what should I do in this situation? We're always happy to help. But I think this is, this is what needs to happen in customer service or customer experience to differentiate on that experience and to act on that experience. So I love that. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, yeah. Maybe explain well, a little I bit of, go ahead. Yeah, and I'll actually I'll inter I'll interrupt you on your own podcast. How about that? <laughs> no, but uh, in another way, you know, and again, I'll do a plug. Uh, you know, the Four Rocks book, and it's you know, it's here with me. But the you know, the Four Rocks book because it's about reducing effort, driving loyalty, and transforming the customer journey. It's got a lot of that step by step how to do it as well that I we just talked through, and ways to you know look at those opportunities. But to your point you've got to get the leadership to really understand that because if, if you're trying to swim upstream too much to continue the river and the rocks analogy, um, it's a little bit difficult. You've got to get the, you know, your executive champions to really understand that because to your point, Nick, that is so key. And, uh, and, you know, even being able to ask them, is it more, is this more important than that? That might actually open some eyes um, and create a, a different kind of dialogue. Absolutely. So this has nothing to do with, um, the next point, but I had the ability to go to Ketchikan, uh, Alaska, where the salmon were swimming upstream and the biggest obstacle that they had because the water was lower were the rocks that were actually in front of them. Yep. And they were trying to go up and around, but there was so many salmon going up the stream that they were struggling to get in the way or out of the way from each other. So I, I think there's an analogy in there somewhere and you can use it on the next featured keynote, uh, <laughs> hey. but I love that. And, and every once in a while, there's a big bear who's trying to catch them as they're jumping up the, over the rocks yeah. too. So, so that's the watch next, out for that. That's the next book. Watch out for the rocks, but specifically watch out for those bears. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so maybe we, we've teased a little bit. You, you explained a little bit about the rocks. So maybe talk about the rock strategy uh, that you have in your book and, and maybe how does that strategy help organizations find and solve big problems that customers face today? Absolutely. Well, again, so, uh, you know, even going deeper into the, the analogy, you know, our customer journey is like a river. We like to think it's a nice, smooth, straight river. Maybe they're on an inner tube and maybe they've got a cold beverage with them and it's a nice, easy one. But too often, it's more like a, a river here in Colorado where it's winding around because it's hitting rocks or the rapids. And, you know, people here in Colorado pay really good money to, to shoot, you know, class four and class five rapids. But if you take that translation to the customer journey, they don't want that, right? They, they're looking for as easy a ride as possible. And so when they hit our rocks, broken processes, poorly trained agents, technology that's either disconnected or just doesn't work right. I mean, those are, the, those are our rocks that they're facing every day. 
So as we looked at it, you know, over the last 15 years specifically, I've really been honing in on how do you identify? So customer effort score was one way I can find directionally using customer effort, especially by journey to say, all right, these journeys are harder than others, but there's so much other data. And so my program isn't just about one metric or one type of technology, et cetera. It's really about bridging the gap. You kind of talked about it a little bit in the intro. I mean, it starts with survey programs, the right kind of survey strategy, the right kind of survey components. It also starts to include operational metrics. Because again, a lot of the operational metrics we have do point to likely rocks. Really high handle time for one specific call type might point you to a rock, especially hold time, because that means agents can't answer the question. Resolution by far was the biggest predictor we found was resolution pointing to high effort or lack thereof, excuse me, to high effort. Uh, but you could look time on page, you know, lack of digital containment on the website. I mean, all of these operational metrics, they're important too, to the experience, not just to, you know, your operations. And then journey and text analytics. I mean, the ability, for instance, journey analytics to actually stitch together you know, from the mobile app to the website, to the chat channel, to the phone channel and see how customers are actually moving, see their rivers, their winding rivers, if you, if you will. Um, it, it's exponentially more valuable to see when is it happening and where is it happening in text analytics, being able to use that and say, oh, well, when they're having to call because they had to leave the website, now what were they talking about? When they say website issues, what are they saying? What's driving that? But the reality is all of that gets brought together with AI now from an analytics standpoint. All the conversation in AI right now is around chat GPT and, and so forth. I, I've done a couple of conferences recently where I think 90% of the, of the sessions were about AI, Gen AI specifically. And it's like, that's great, but you gotta use AI before you use AI. Meaning yeah. use the more traditional AI, the, the research kind of AI, that machine learning to really you know, pull all that data together and understand the experience. Because if you go embed new kind of AI tools, but they don't fit where the biggest challenges are, again, you're going you're gonna to maybe, maybe, maybe be solving for something that wasn't necessary to solve for. So that opportunity to really dig deep. And that's ultimately what the rock strategy is. It's, it's bringing to bear not necessarily new technology that a company doesn't already have. In many cases, it's using the technology a company has in better and new ways with the right mindset and strategy to actually get more out of it. Um, I, I was working with a company recently and, and we were talking and they're like, well, you know, I asked them, do you record your calls? Yeah, we record our calls. Okay, do you transcribe those and have a tool that you look at? Yeah. What do you use that for? Well, if somebody calls in and complains, what else? No, that's it oh my, you got all this great data that with a little bit of analysis, you could really start to understand what's going on with your customers at scale. Um, and so again, not everybody's at that point and, you know, et cetera. I, you know, I, I work with some that are very new and some that are very mature. The reality is you probably have more than you think you do. And, and in some cases, the, the argument is, well, it's all, the data is all in silos. Uh, there are great vendors you can use too to help bring those those data points together, even if just at a sampled level to really understand it. And so those are some of those opportunities I'm I'm trying to champion, you know, for as many people as I can talk to because you know this is our opportunity. And and I, you know I like to say it's like if someone and companies really take this and they do it right, um, they will transform their business and they will be successful reducing effort and driving loyalty. If they don't they may be a, end up like a bed, bath and beyond the ability to make money. Mm -hmm. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> in, in addition, it helps you differentiate from everybody else in your vertical or across the marketplace. If, if you can actually do what you say you're going to do, you can communicate effectively. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be, uh, it has to be good. It has to be a different model than everybody else is doing. And it can't be a broken, the, the foundation has to at least be there. And, and I like what you said about uh, use machine learning before you use, use AI before you use AI. And I was confused for a second there. I was like, wait a second, where is Sean going here? But I do like that because they, most organizations have a machine learning or even customer sentiment inside that contact center where they can see when somebody says, I want to talk to a manager or I, uh, even on the on the employee side, they raise their voice or somebody dropped a four letter word that, uh, you know, that 
isn't appropriate. And so you can use that data to make better decisions. In addition, I feel like there's so much data out there inside of the customer service or customer experience that the rest of the organization has no idea. And if you can actually help the rest of the organization um, with their with their spot and, and they're saying, hey, we have an increase of, of calls because we have a, there's a default sweater. Okay, well, let's go back to manufacturing and figure out what the biggest issue is and let's nip it right away. Uh, and it could be a bunch of other things, but what are the reports or what what's the data that the people actually need today that they don't have today that you can make them look like a hero and then you're you're raising all boats um and yeah. you're getting way of getting rid of the salmon and and the rocks are becoming smaller so i i do love that but maybe if you could share maybe what what's a couple examples of how organizations have used data to make customer service better across different ways customers have reached out absolutely I, i'll give you a couple examples uh well, one of them, so uh, a recent, you know, win that we had, we were working with a group, uh, I was working with a group and and they were, you know, I have what's called because of the the program and how you look at it, what's called a rocks report and it helps highlight. Uh, it's literally a heat map that shows where are the hot spots. And we were running it on a weekly basis. And all of a sudden, one week, there's a specific journey that jumped 10 spots in effort. We're like, okay, something happened, right? Um, and when we sat down and looked at it, we saw that it had jumped in um, website issues and lack of resolution. So like, okay, that's a big deal. And we knew it had something to do with the web as well. And so very quickly, we kind of honed in on here are calls associated with that activity because we all that data was now put together and, and brought together. We found out that immediately the, the digital team had moved an email up by two days. They wanted to make things faster. Problem is by moving it up two days, it actually broke the process. And so when people were clicking on a link, it was actually breaking everything and they literally had to start all the way over from scratch. And so it was creating all this challenge. And that's a great example. And, and you know, the second we highlighted it, I picked up the phone and I talked to my, the team that ran the quality organization and literally within a few minutes, they were like, oh yeah, we're hearing this new thing occasionally, um, you know, within the call center. So it was happening in the call center. The call center knew it, but they couldn't put it together into the impact that it was having. It was just, yeah, we had this spike in this kind of call, but because again, you know, every agent's one and done, moving to the next call, the next call, the next call, it wasn't rolling that message up. The technology or the reporting we did showed it immediately. And, you know, then we were able to make that, that resolution. And in fact, that's a great example of what we're seeing more and more is again, going back to that, that earlier example I said, where the company wasn't really using their um, their text analytics for their, you know, call transcripts, you know, we actually introduced that content to the digital team and because they were begging us for more surveys and we're like, if you don't, the surveys aren't going to give you what you think you're going to get. I said, rather look at this. And all of a sudden they were able to see all sorts of rich information by looking at the calls where customers were talking about poor website issue or website challenges. And they were learning literally hourly, all these things that they needed to understand without having to survey the client at all from the data they already had. Hmm. That's such a good example because you're using the data that they already have. And, and some people think when it comes to customer experience, I'm just going to do it the same way I've always done it. And I'm going, to, I'm not ready to spend that additional money to create the pixie dust and fairy tales. And what you're saying, and I appreciate that and I agree is that, you already have the information. You just need to do something about it. Yeah. That's great. Absolutely. I mean, closed loop um, at a minimum, obviously, being able to close the loop with people who complain, it's top, hopefully, on most companies, you know, radars. Someone takes a survey and, and gives bad feedback. Let's call them. Let's kind of close the loop. But what about when they don't take a survey? But because you're using data the right way, you can predict that their effort would be really high because of the same, they look like a cohort that already said this was a really hard situation and this is why. What's even better than that proactive response is saying, it looked like you're dealing with kind of a difficult issue right now because you've called us multiple times and here, you know, we're seeing this, this opportunity. You know, are, are you getting what you need or can we, do we need to step in and help you? I know, I know in my own experience, I dealt with over the months of June, July and August, I dealt with a bank 
uh, that will rename or you know remain nameless. What's a rhyme with Sean? <laughs> but I was I, I literally was talking to them multiple times a week and I was getting bounced around like we all are. I was ha- I was hitting I mean, I was hitting boulders, massive rocks in, in my way constantly. And every time I would call, I get someone new and they didn't know what was going on. And if someone had proactively seen that this was going on and been able to reach out from an advocacy advocacy perspective and said, hey, you've been calling a lot about it seems like a similar thing. What's going on? I mean, come on. That is huge. And think a little bit about how much your call volume might reduce if you actually go after these kind of frequent flyers who are having these really horrible journeys. Because that's the difference between task and journey, right? A task is kind of a one thing. I call, I get something done, I'm gone. Like password reset or something. Change my phone number. But when you think about the journeys, what you really need to be focused on are what are those events, those journeys, those things that customers are doing that usually do take more than one interaction. Maybe it does take more than one channel. And unfortunately, when bad, it takes a lot of time and energy and multiple contacts. That's what you're honing into to truly try to find that because that's where most of the challenges are. We've gotten really good in business. One channel, one task, I can do pretty good. It's the breakage between the channels, the contact channels and the different tools and technology and human channels. That's where things are breaking down. And that again goes back to don't just use, you know, new technology and think it's going to solve things. You've got to make that that journey connect. It truly has to be omni-channel and not just multi-channel in how you support your clients. So if that bank would have taken that initiative and reached out to you, how would that have made you feel? Oh, amazing. Um, and you know, I would say that's when when you want to say, how do you delight customers? That's one of the best ways you delight. I mean, you don't delight customers by just trying to you know, uh, give them, give stuff away or, or wow them because this person is so polite. Um, you know, you, your delight is identifying proactively where things might be wrong and fixing them either proactively. So they don't happen at all. And granted, you don't get credit if, if you fix it without them knowing, but it still improves the experience. But for sure, when something has started and they're down that, that road is jumping in and saying, instead of making you call me over and over again, I'm going to send you an email. Here's a number direct number to a group. They already know what's going on. You know, call us here as this is going on because we want to resolve this for you. That should be on everybody's objective because that's how you're identifying those, those rocks, those challenges. And, and, you know, if you can't fix them up front, you're really taking a different approach to resolving them on the back end. So of the surveys that you've taken as a consumer and you, you gave them a nasty gram, let's say it was a, a three, two, or one. What's the percentage of times that the, that the company actually called you back or interacted back with you uh, from that bad survey? A very low percentage. Um, it might be double digit, but barely. Um, 20%, I, you know, max uh, of companies who are really taking that opportunity. In fact, um, you know, here's, here's something to be cautious of. Some companies have, have, you know, automated this process. Oh, Hey, let's, let's, you know, automate this. So if someone gives us a poor score, we're going to send them a link for a, you know, a $10 off. Um, and, uh, this is not my story, but a friend of mine, you know, told me that he was, uh, he was actually testing this out. And so he rented, it was a car rental and he rented cars a lot. And so he did have a bad experience and he sent that in and he got a $10 coupon. Okay. Well, the grand scheme of thing, that's all right. So then he ran it again, got the survey, had a good experience, but he went, he was, I'm going to test this, gave him a bad score, got another coupon. He literally did that over six months and they sent him, you know, it was something like uh, 10 different $10 off coupons because they had automated it, but no one picked up the phone and called. Wow. Um, and, you know, he's in our space. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things, probably Nick, you and I do uh, just to test people out. But he, he talked about that and saying, you know, that's, you know, and, and, you know, my take of that is, you know, great, but that's not what they want. You know, $10 isn't really, you know, making sure that their, their issue is resolved. And, and that usually takes human. And, and, and this goes to, I believe wholeheartedly, the more technology we throw at customers, chatbots, verbal AI, you know, gen AI, you know, interactions, you know, that are coming, the more technology we throw at people, the more they're going to want the human experience. And I think the right companies aren't going to use these tools just to reduce call volume. 
They're going to use these tools and capabilities to enhance their employee performance. So their employees don't want to leave. So they have a better you know, employee base and they're having a better experience, which are creating even better experience. And they're capitalizing on the harmony between technology and human interaction versus I'm just going to reduce cost. I mean, think about what that can do for the right kind of organizations. Yeah. Somebody once told me that human is the heart and machine is the mastery. Like if you can automate a lot of that mundane tasks, great. But when somebody, when somebody's parent dies and they got to contact that insurance company, you want to be there with a human and sitting on that, on that interaction for as long as they need. Just be present yeah. and solve the problem and at least one effort. Yeah. You do last not summer. Want- yeah. Ahead. I'm sorry. Last summer I was on a panel and, and, you know, the last question on the panel was one of those softballs. What do you, you know, put your crisp, you know, look at your crystal ball. What do you think the contact center is going to be like in, you know, in five years? Um, and this is before even, you know, chat GPT came out, you know, later that fall. And so I was kind of, well, here's what I think, what I thought I, as an agent, I'm going to want to talk to people. I'm going to have the personality of empathy and, you know, I want that human connection and I want to provide that the perfect empathetic, you know, person, maybe I I'm not as good multitasking, but I am that kind of person. Well, guess what? I'm having a conversation with you, Nick. And, and as I'm talking to you, my focus is on you, but the tools, like you said, the mastery, they're doing all the work. They're listening to the call in real time and bringing up articles and saying, here's some notes to look at, you know, and summarizing it in more of a gen AI perspective than trying to read through the whole thing. And over here, if, if I say, you know, I want to place this order, you know, X number of this product, it's plugging it into the billing system. I'm verifying as the agent that everything is functioning properly. I'm the kind of that last tension. I approve that, approve that. But my focus is on you. I said that last summer and I said five years. Uh, ask me now. <laughs> That's going to happen in you know less than a, you know maybe two years at most. We're already yeah. getting there, and it's it's an amazing time. But it's the it, again, it's that time to invest in the people even more, in a way, and getting the right people that want to do that job full time and supporting them and being able to really drive that and and use the technology and the tools to make their lives easier, just as you are your customers, but use the power of that technology, you know, for that that kind of. I guess, higher level purpose, if you will. It's the, it's the higher, the, the, the more priority, the higher, higher of importance, the VIPs, the, even, even the people that are not VIPs, but you now have the ability due to the efficiencies of your platform to ha- interact with more people from human to human interaction. You have the ability to retain more employees because you're driving efficiencies internally to create a better experience externally. If, yeah. if you're not going to do that, you're going to continue to have that turnover. People are going to continue to get frustrated. They're going to have 10, 15 applications open at the same time. They're going to ask Sean how the weather is in Colorado because they're stalling. It's it's going to it's predictable. Uh, yep. What you you want to be predictable in the right way, not for the wrong reasons. Exactly. So lastly. Uh, in your book, you talk about how unresolved challenges can lead to more and more problems later on. And as a, as a you know, a analogy, uh, I love your analogies. I'm going to kind of throw one out as well. If I keep eating junk food over and over and over again, uh, my arteries are going to continue to get plugged and plugged and plugged by these little micro uh, uh, plaque pieces. But over time, that's going to get and build and build and build until eventually that's going to get plugged. And um, I think the same is true with the interactions of that customer expectation or the customer experience. So if you could share some examples of how companies can stop these problems from piling up uh, to keep giving customers a great experience and to remove the rocks in that process. Absolutely. Well, to your, you know, to that point, um, Knowing where they are, knowing what the problems are, but then doing nothing about it. I mean, that is, you know, that's the definition of insanity, right? You know, do the same things and expect different results. So you have to, just like you said, you've got to address them. You've got to, you know, find them for a purpose of doing something about them. Now, the way I talk about it in the book, for instance, I actually use a little bit of a, a of my own kind of uh, anagram, but it's break the rocks. 
Um, you know, if something's bad enough, you may blast it, blow it up. Now you got to be careful with collateral damage, but if something, a rock that's in your customer's way is so bad and so egregious, you may have to just rip it out piece of technology, you know, et cetera. Um, I mean, that's probably the most extreme. We all want to remove them, right? We want to remove. So the, the R of break is remove. And that takes a, you know, it takes time and funding and energy to, to pull that out. But then there's erosion, the E. You can let things, maybe you can't fund every rock you find, but you can do little things at a time. You let that rock kind of wear down a little bit uh, instead of build up by doing little things, maybe in conjunction with other projects. The last two are even different though. There are rocks that you just have to accept. Again, as you go to this opportunity, you try to find these things uh, and what you need to be working on. There will be items, again, you're going to find more than you can deal with. And some you're just going to have to accept and know I can't even touch them for to erode them. They're just going to have to sit there um, until at a later date. But you got to keep that running inventory of things that you're, you know, that are that are still on the list because you always have to be relooking that. And the last is keep. So there are rocks, there are pain points, there are struggles that you actually have to keep due to legal reasons or uh, you know, other things of that nature. And so the, the idea really is understanding, once you understand the rocks, then you kind of look at putting them into the, each of their different break categories to understand how are we doing it. But at the end of the day, you've got to do something with that information. What's really interesting when, when I run this report for most groups and do this analysis is um, some of the lower call volume issues are the hardest. Um, and it, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, but because uh, the agents aren't practiced with those items there, you know, they don't get them once a day, they get them maybe once a quarter. And so then there's a lot of hold time. There's a lot of, Oh, how do I handle this? You know, type of thing. Um, but again, if you identify an inventory, all these opportunities, things like that jump out and very easily you can say, reminder training, keep this on track. Because what we found often is, you know, higher volume, they have more self-help. They have a lot more training, very practice, lower volume, not so much, but little things can make a huge impact to those lower volume items because the other issue is often those lower volume, very painful items lead to a higher rate of churn uh, of your customer. And so then when you inventory these lists of opportunities, you've got to be looking across the board. You can't just prioritize your top call drivers and say, all right, we're just going to focus here because sometimes those are less impactful than going after some of those other ones. And that's why you've got to do that inventory. You've got to really understand what's there, what can we do about it? And, uh, and then put some effort towards that, even if it's, you know, training periodically just to remind people of how to handle something that's less frequent that you know is very painful. Because again, at the end of the day, you want to pull, you know, you, you want to eliminate some of those plaque modules in the artery because you don't want a heart attack. Um, you know, you want this to, to be successful and you've got to basically focus on pulling those out because if you don't, um, again, you're going to be in trouble. You'll wake up and, and it will have been a landslide and, and now you're completely blocked uh, on your ability to do something. The first one that you popped up was blow it up and, and watch out for the pieces that are coming out. <clears throat> I would also say on the, the reverse of that is if you leave that huge rock, there's still, even though there's, there's not pieces from that rock, there's still shrapnel from that experience that are coming back that you are feeling as an organization, but as the consumer is feeling as well. And they will be, they will start leaving that shrapnel everywhere that they go moving forward uh, for as long as they stay with you. And even if they leave to that next company, they're going to continue to be the that naysayer because you didn't meet that expectation because you had that consistent rock. Um, the last thing I would say is that inventory is crucial because if you don't know what you have then you have no idea where to go and you're just sitting in the middle of the stream trying to figure out what, I, what I'm going to do next is the water is rising. And so I would, I would challenge everybody to kind of take that assessment first is understand where you are because then you can actually do something about it. The same is true with metrics. Uh, yep. this is, so, uh, this is, this has been a great conversation. Uh, Sean, what's the best way for my people to, to get in front of you or connect with you or, or read your book, uh, give them, give them all the places. Absolutely. Well, Sean Albertson on LinkedIn, Albertson, like the grocery store. I always like to say that cause it usually creates a memory. Uh, but my website is also CX number four rocks.com. So CX for rocks.com. Again, customer experience for the purpose of rocks. And so the book is also for rocks. So 
um, yeah, reach out to me, uh, you know, through those channels. I look forward to connecting and always willing to chat with folks and share some ideas and, and, you know, help people out because again, customer experience is hard and it's getting harder. And all of us that are in this role, you know, we're in this together and, uh, and we're in this community, if you will, that is, um, trying to do things so much better and, and we need to support each other in that way. So reach out to me as, uh, as much as you want and look forward to connecting with listeners and Nick, thanks for joining or letting me join your podcast, uh, and talk, uh, talk a little bit about rocks today. Uh, my wife does say, I kind of have rocks in my head. Um, uh, she'll, she'll talk about a bad experience and I'll say, you know what that is? <laughs> and she's like, shut up. <laughs> so, but it, I'm passionate about it. And my hope for every listener out there is, you know, that I can help that maybe these ideas can help even the story of, and the analogy of the river and the rocks in the river causing the challenge for the customer. Um, man, if that helps people visualize it and get some hearts and minds involved in this, this, uh, never ending process, then, uh, that's, that's a win for me. Sounds like a plan, man. Well, like. Like Sean had mentioned to all my listeners, go out and connect with him, uh, share this episode with your leadership and keep taking notes and keep focusing on the experience. So Sean, it's been a pleasure and uh, we'll looking forward to what you're up to here and, and wishing you nothing but success.